the First and Second Opium War. The British Empire was the biggest drug dealer in the late 18th century. The British Empire took a hit to its economy and prestige from its loss of 13 colonies in the American Revolutionary War. On the other side of the world, the British found themselves handing over large amounts of gold and silver to China as payment for importing silks, tea, and porcelain, Chinese goods that were much in demand in Europe. The solution to both these setbacks was diabolical in its conception and execution. They decided to fund the imports of Chinese goods by selling opium. Opium was already being imported into China, but the quantities imported were to jump dramatically. Imports of opium into China stood at 200 chests annually in 1729 to 40,000 chests in 1838. Where was all this opium being grown? Very conveniently in East India, a British colony at that time. The British were aware of how lucrative an industry opium could become because of the highly addictive nature of the drug. And by the early 19th century, there were serious addiction issues across the Qing dynasty. This large-scale addiction led to severe social and economic disruption, which culminated in the dynasty banning the importation and consumption of opium in 1839. However, due to the high returns on exporting opium, the British Empire completely disregarded the ban on opium and continued to sell the drug on Chinese ports. As a result, the Qing dynasty cut all ties with the British, terminating all trade and in particular, reinforcing the ban on opium. The British responded with the First Opium War. Using warships, they attacked and colonized Hong Kong and made their way north, forcefully establishing numerous British-controlled trade ports along the Chinese East Coast. The Second Opium War 1856-1860 after establishing these ports, they continued their sale of opium despite the damaging effects it had on the greater Chinese population. In 1856 the British were unhappy with China. The reason for this was that China, having recently been defeated in the previous Opium War, was supposed to give concessions to Britain, which it had yet to do. Another issue was that British consumption of tea was so great that Britain was operating a huge trade deficit with China. The only thing salvaging British finances was the continued sale of opium into China from British India. Another problem was that China was currently dealing with the Taiping Rebellion, whose leaders kept destroying opium wherever they found it. The sale of opium into China was vital for balancing Britain's finances, and so it had to keep flowing. In late 1856, the governor of Canton, Yi Mingchen, impounded a Chinese-operated ship that he believed was committing piracy, or at least was working on behalf of the rebels. One problem, though, the ship was registered in Hong Kong, now a British territory, and as a result, the British were furious. Frankly, the British consul to China, Harry Parks, was itching for another war there because he wanted to make a name for himself. He offered to give the sailors back, but Britain said no and sailed the Royal Navy up the Pearl River and shelled Canton. Back in Britain, Parliament was fiercely against any war with China, but the Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston, was very much for it. Parliament voted against any further action, mostly because of the outbreak of a major mutiny in India in 1857. As a result, Palmerston called an election, and after denouncing the Chinese as barbarians to the British people, he won, and so war it was. An alliance was built with the French, because they also wanted to trade with China, but the Americans, after taking a fort in late 1856, declared the neutrality, and Russia wanted nothing to do with it, because they were still recovering from the Crimean War. So the war in China, the Second Opium War, followed a similar path to the first. The Royal Navy used their ironclad, steam-powered warships to obliterate the Chinese wooden ships called junks wherever they met. In late 1857, Anglo-French forces captured Canton and captured Di, who was then imprisoned in India. After this, the British and French navies made their way up the coast of China, harassing the defenders and smashing forts as they went. The Chinese emperor, the Giant Feng Emperor of the Qing Dynasty, soon after opted to sue for peace. The negotiations resulted in the Treaty of Tianjin, which gave France, Russia, the U.S., and Britain the right to trade and for their citizens to freely travel throughout China. The U.S. and Russia were allowed to get in on the action despite not fighting because it meant that if China backed down on their agreements, it would risk retaliation from all four powers. Plus, Russia had just negotiated the transfer of this territory. The king didn't want another front to fight on. One problem, when negotiators went to Beijing to ratify this truce in 1859, they were kidnapped and tortured by the Chinese government. This, for the British, was proof that their opinion of the Chinese as being little more than barbarians was justified. The commander of the British forces in China, the Earl of Elgin, was actually against the war, but after the capture of the negotiators, he felt that he had to retaliate to protect Britain's honor. The British and French then landed their forces in the north and captured many forts on their way to Beijing. They soon clashed with a large Qing army at the Battle of Palakau. They saw over a thousand Chinese casualties, compared to about 50 on the Anglo-French side. The Chinese had now lost the will to pursue the war, mostly because of, again, the ongoing Taiping Rebellion. After the battle, the emperor fled Beijing, leaving his brother, Prince Gong, to negotiate with the Europeans. Anglo-French forces then moved on Beijing, which opened its gates to them, after which the most famous event of the war happened. 
The Allied soldiers forced their way into and looted the Emperor's summer palace, and when Elgin found out the Chinese had killed many of the envoys, he ordered it burned to the ground. The Chinese then signed the 1860 Treaty of Beijing, which did several things. It confirmed the 1858 treaty, increased the reparations that China would pay, gave Russia more territory, and also saw Britain gain slightly more land around Hong Kong. Interestingly, this war is called the Second Opium War, but opium's role was largely secondary. This time, it was about enforcing open trade and demonstrating to China that Europeans were now the dominant ones in the region. This story of a drug dealer going to war against a whole country to preserve the right to export an almost unimaginable quantity of drugs has to be crowned as the biggest and most barbaric example of drug dealing ever witnessed in history.